when I have two French bulldog puppies and they oftentimes um, Zoom bomb all of my meetings, I gave a presentation to a law firm recently and they were shredding up wee-wee pads in the background and this is just life now. So if they do anything bad yesterday, I spoke to a group of 300 people and they were snoring. So I'm just, I apologize in advance for this. So, all right, I'm gonna share my screen and I just wanna make sure you guys can see this. Phil, you're recording. Well said. Recording. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Just nod, yes, okay. So thank you guys for joining us today for this Leopard Solutions webinar on examining the long road to partnership for women lawyers. We have a great panel today for you. So I'd love for the panelists to introduce themselves. So Jill, would you mind telling us a little bit about you and your background? Sure, absolutely. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, my name is Jill Kahi. I am the Director of Lateral Integration at Cozen O'Connor. Um, I started out as a practicing attorney at Cozen uh, after I graduated law school about 12 years ago now um, and spent just over five years in practice and then shifted to a recruiting role. Um, spent four years focused on our associate and non-partner recruiting. And then a couple years ago, joined our strategic expansion team um, in this current role. So I focus on helping our incoming um, partners and lateral groups with their transition and integration. Awesome. What I really love about Jill's background is that she will give us the lawyer, well, she's not the only lawyer on the panel. So that's great. We have people like, you know, who've done lots of different things. And one of the things that if you don't necessarily want to be a partner, there are other alternative career roles, such as what Jill is doing. So that is also a nice thing to know, right? Absolutely. Jennifer, will you tell us a little bit about you? Sure. I'm Jennifer Gilman. I run Gilman Strategic Group, where we work with law firm partners and groups who have significant portable business to find them their exact right, perfect fit. Like Jill, I'm also a recovering lawyer. <laughs> I practiced for about 12 years. I was mostly a management side employment attorney, and I really enjoyed it very much, but we'll get to later probably that it, it's not a great job to have if you want to see your children. So there are some other careers to have with a law degree. Thank you so much for putting this together. Oh, awesome. That's great. So again, you know, the legal recruiting side is also another career path that is often taken by recovering attorneys, as you put it, Jennifer. Laura Leopard, will you tell Hi. us about you? <laughs> Hi, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you. Thanks to all of our guests for coming on and being able to share your thoughts, opinions, feelings about this issue. We're so happy to contribute data uh, to this discussion. We are a women-owned business here at Leopard Solutions, so this is something that's really close to our heart. So thank you all for joining, and thanks, Stephanie, for this great idea. Yeah, thank you. And so one thing I will mention for Laura, like, so Laura is a recovering um, actor, so <laughs> you never know. And, and Laura's background is very interesting because she is an entrepreneur, and so you know, you never know where you'll fall and how ideas happen. So um, there's a great profile of Laura on in my Women Who Wow series, um, which I'm happy to shoot over to you guys. You should read about her. So you never know how an idea could get started that turns into a very successful business. Alexis Robertson, will you tell us a little bit about you? Sure, happy to. Um, my name is Alexis Robertson. I'm Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Foley and Lardner out of their Chicago office. I too am a recovering lawyer. I spent about the first eight years of my career um, as practicing. The first, the bulk of that was at Kirkland and Ellis as a commercial litigator and the remainder of the time as a labor employment lawyer at Seifroth Shaw. My transition between practicing and doing dedicated DNI work was actually as a legal recruiter and outside recruiter. So I'm very familiar with Laura and with Leopard Solutions. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much for having me here today. Awesome. I think you guys know what my first question is going to be when we get to it. <laughs> um, it's, it's going to be about why you guys decided to not practice law anymore. So um, think about your answers, guys, in a, in a minute. Um, and Danielle, tell us a little bit about you. 
Hi, um, I'm Danny Rossetti. I go by Danny. Um, my first profession, I was a teacher. Um, and then I went to law school and I also practiced for a few years, but I've been in administration for about 15 years now. Um, the roles that I've had in administration covered the areas of legal recruiting, professional development, diversity, and human resources. Um, I was most recently um, named the chief talent officer at the beginning of this year. So my personal story when I look at this is examining the road to the C-suite. Um, I have my you know, own stories to share that are very transferable, but throughout all of the positions that I've had, I've been very invested in the advancement of women. Awesome, thank you. And just a little bit about me, you know, who, who am I? Um, I've worked with law firms for 20 years, did not set out to do this. I was an editor at a magazine where I used to write the horoscopes actually randomly. Um, and I started off working at Paul Weiss and then I worked at all these other firms and I have done legal marketing. I've also worked in recruiting. I have seen everything. I have written everything under the sun and I have seen the long road that women have had to make partner. It is part of the reason why, and I've managed alumni programs as well, which is also why I started this Women Who Wow initiative that I do on the side now where I also consult for law firms. Um, and I'm very passionate about this, which is why I said to Laura and Phil, I really want to do a webinar like this and do more things like this and bring awareness to this and have a conversation. So Alex, both Alexis and Laura have both been in that series. And I hope that Jennifer and Jill and Danny will be in this series as well. But there is so much we can do and there is so much I have seen. And, and let me just go through this a little bit. Um, the numbers are staggering. Laura is going to show us some research, but we start off almost on an even playing field when it comes to the number of women who are in law school and then they don't make partner. And I did a research, you know, I, the articles, when you search why women aren't making partner or the gender gap, they start, the articles start in the eighties, the nineties, the 2000s. I mean, I pulled some articles from Forbes, Above the Law. I, you know, look at the headlines here. Women lawyers less likely to make partner. The Obviously, the pay gap issues. I mean, with most law firms, you know, the, the pay is less of an issue oftentimes because it's more of, um, you know, the salaries are set with class years. But they're imbalances, right? Women are missing from the top ranks of law firms. We've seen different things in recent years. We're seeing male managing partners now or female. They're not getting promoted to partner. Um, if you are diverse and you're a woman, it's even worse. This is an article from the New York Times in 2006, and it focused on a woman at Proskauer who I used to work with, and it talked about her a lot, but it talked about women in general, right? And you'll see, you're, you know, it, the nation had been producing law school graduates at a very even rate. And then there was a big imbalance, right? And I, you know, the quotes are terrible. <laughs> this entire article, I encourage you to read it. Um, and I don't think much has changed today from 2006. This is an article from Chambers Associate that just said, you know, one in five make partner. Laura's statistics will show you some something, you know, similar. Um, if you have interesting work, but no one to support you, um, you know, there's also obviously issues related to childcare. I thought the quote about we're weeding out women way too soon was interesting and a real bummer. Um, and, you know, I, they talked about here, you know, lawyers have very limited time to mentor. So they're mentoring the people they think are going to succeed. They think men won't leave when they have kids. So they gravitate toward them. And even when women don't leave, it's still in people's minds that they will. And so it's always a self-fulfilling prophecy. Men have completely different experiences and appear to look much more to navigate the first year. And men, women are being mentored. So we are gonna talk about mentorship and programs like that. And it's, um, it's unfortunate because I think there is something to be said for the fact that based on our gender, there are issues that are right off the bat going to stand against us um, because we are the ones who carry children. And so the children issue is, is going to be an issue. Okay, so Laura, I'm gonna ask you if you can share the data that you shared with us. So Laura pulled some data from Leopard Solutions um, at vast database and I shared it with the team and I got back from some of the speakers. Wow, <laughs> I think that was like the collective sort of like, 
Oh, okay, yeah. And none of you seem surprised with what we what what we had. So, Laura, can you take us through the, um, the data, and then and we're going to talk about it. I think that's the overarching thing we'll probably all realize when, once we get to the end of this is none of this is surprising. Yeah. Right. And the same reasons that women don't make it into partnership have been the same reasons for many, many years. So uh, it's um, it's a tough road. And I'm hoping that by bringing data, numbers, everything to the forefront, it'll make people think a little more about uh, changing this road to partnership. We all, we all know it's difficult. We all know there's lots of obstacles, which I'm sure we'll go into with uh, great detail shortly. So we'll just kind of dive into the numbers a bit. Let me go back. So first of all, I, I thought we'd just take a second and talk about why, why we care about this so much. You know, uh, this summer we spent an enormous amount of time, effort, and money getting diversity data into our database. So we have ethnic diversity data. We also have gender diversity data, and we have it on every law firm, every attorney in our database. And therefore, it allows us to report on it. And we feel that by reporting on it and bringing things to the forefront, it might help people look at this problem, realize there is one, and then take some steps to correct it. So this is a, this is a law firm uh, in the top 200 where they have 13% of their partnership that are gender diverse. They also have 13% of ethnic diverse uh, folks in their partnership, but those are very low numbers. This is a top 200 firm and they're not alone in having these low numbers. We see now that ethnic diversity numbers, gender diversity numbers, diversity of all kinds is being more and more recognized by the business world. And it's helping them to make decisions about what law firms they choose to work with and they choose to support. It's, it's like so many other things in the world, right? When business and money starts to become a part of this conversation, there might be some more movement in these areas. Business can drive uh, movement at the law firms by demanding that law firms offer them more diverse partners and associates to work with. And we do feel that getting these numbers out there is a, an important part of this, helping them to recognize uh, what's important to businesses as they make these decisions and then making these numbers available. We also came out with our law firm index this year, and we have made those diversity numbers part of that index. So that is one data point that we include. We do think it is going to impact the health of the law firms as businesses tend to be using this more and more to make those business decisions. So the first thing that we looked at and a question that we get all the time is how long does it take to make partner? So we looked at it in two different ways. We looked at it for laterals and then we looked at it for entry level hires. The first thing you can see from this chart is that it takes longer to make partner. It takes longer for laterals to make partner than it did in the past. It's really increased year over year. And these are the numbers that we're looking at down here. So it's, it's interesting to see how so, some numbers have uh, gone up more than others. They haven't, they haven't doubled, but they have gone up. So this again is for lateral partners, right? Non-diverse men have the shortest path to partner for all years. It was close or is close right now in 2021, but that's subject to change because we're only in that first quarter. And diverse women struggle most year, but one bright spot is in 2020 where diverse women had a shorter path to partnership than anyone else. On the flip side, non-diverse women did not have a good year and it took longer for them to make partner than any other group. Now, now we're gonna look at it by the number of promotions and just with the basic divide, men and women. So as you can see, the men of course are doing quite well on the promotion, on promotion way. <laughs> Here are all the numbers associated with this chart. 
And 2021 is still in progress. We do expect, of course, these numbers to rise to meet 2020 or, or go above it in promotion numbers. But let's look at the gaps a bit, right? Uh, in 2012, we had a gap. It wasn't quite as large as it was here, but really the largest gaps are some of the most recent years. So if we look at the gap map at the bottom, it was much more narrow here, slightly wider here, and then it just keeps widening when really the largest gap is in you know 2019 uh, and, and including a 2020 as well so that gap is actually growing at the, at the moment now let's look at the at the same thing by the numbers but let's put some diversity data in there as well so non-diverse men that's that big yellow line stretch, you know stretching up to the sky in second position, non-diverse women are second, which sounds good, but it's not a close second. <laughs> Look at the disparity between non-diverse men and non-diverse women. That is a yawning gap there. Now, the good news for diversity promotions is the number of promotions has grown over the years. So that, so that, is, that is good, but the disparity has not. The disparity has not lessened, right? The numbers have grown, the disparity has not lessened, but the number of promotions have also grown. They have also grown for laterals. So we're talking about laterals in all of these slides. Now we're gonna look at the numbers for entry-level hires. Once again, we see that it's taking longer for somebody that comes in as an entry-level hire to make partner. However, it's, it's dramatically longer for entry levels than it is for lateral hires, right? But we're talking about number of days at the firm. So for 2012, it took a diverse male 1,479 days on average to make partner. Today, it's 3,117. So that number has doubled, right? If you look at diverse females, 1,586 days back in 2012, and now it's 3,128 again. So entry-level hires have a bit of a larger problem than laterals do. And it's not because laterals come with experience because we're counting number of days and we're comparing it by year. So for both groups, the number of days to make partners has increased, but for entry level people, it has more than doubled in a number of cases. So the time to make partner has increased. And I would imagine for women, that's an incredibly dramatic number because that puts a really big obstacle in front of them. The longer that it takes to make partner, if they're postponing having a baby, they're postponing getting married, and now it takes that much longer to make a partner, I guess the question is, is it even worth it to make partner? Now we're still talking about entry level hires. So now we're talking just women and men, we've taken diversity out of the equation. So entry level hires, look at the promotions by the numbers. They have dwindled, they have dwindled. So if you recall on that lateral slide, the number of promotions has grown. It has increased year over year. But if you enter that firm as a law student or after you graduate law school, the number of promotions out of that pool has gone way down. You know, if, just, to, just to look at it from, a, you know, from an attorney perspective, you would lateral somewhere else. If you really wanted to make partner, you might feel that your odds are better of making partner by going in somewhere else, especially when you look at these numbers. Now, of course, it's important to remember averages are an average. And when you look at it on a firm by firm level, there can be completely different stories. But this tells one basic story, and that is fewer people that come in, those homegrown folks are getting promoted to partner. Now, if we look at the gap between women and men, the gap has really narrowed. Look at that in 2020, and it's been narrowing all along. So they're being promoted more on an equal footing but there's less pie to go around because the number of promotions for this group is actually dwindled. 
So this is, we're, this is by the numbers again, and now we're gonna fold in that diversity information. So white males, you know, again, reaching for the sky. But again, look at the, the numbers have dwindled. I mean, there's no getting around it. The numbers for diverse people uh, making partners, this is by the numbers, it's actually slightly less. You know, I mean, 2021, we can't look at really, but for 2020, it looks like diverse women did a little bit better, diverse men did a little bit worse. They were even in 2019, the women jumped ahead in 2018, but again, the wide disparity is really great. And we're still looking at a dwindling piece of the pie, you know, for them to grab from. We thought we would also take a look to see where they exit to. Now, I don't, I, I don't have data on every single exit, but from the women and men that exited their firm and we know where they landed, this is the data. So I think I, I, I looked at a large number of folks and then I only looked at the results where we had an answer. And I, and I think this is something we all sort of know in the back of our head too, right? Women go to in-house. They go to in-house companies more frequently because a lot of the reason that compels them to go is quality of life, right? They can work normal hours. They can go home and see their kids. So women exited uh, to a great extent to in-house companies. Women exited to law firms as well, but there is a, a sharp uh, decline in them exiting to law firms. And Stephanie asked a good question the other day. It was like, how many exited to another top 200 law firm? Because in this universe that we're looking at, we're looking at top 200 firm data. There were a lot of exits to non top 200 firms where I would imagine as well, the demands are not as great as staying at one of those tippy top firms. For men, they exited to another law firm. You know, that was their number one choice, 676 of them. Uh, for government agencies, a good number of women, I'm talking district attorney's office or other types of government agencies, but the in-house was the, the clear winner for women. So we talked about averages a minute ago. Um, the average number of female partners versus male partners is 26.3%, which doesn't sound awful, right? It's not 13% like we saw for that, that one firm, but those averages really don't tell the whole story uh, because once you look at it on a firm by firm level, I mean, these are our women all-stars up here. These are the ones with the highest number of women partners. You know, Fragoman is, you know, far and away uh, the biggest. So th these all have a really good number of female partners, but these numbers are all well above that 26%. And it's because there are so many firms in the top 200 that have really bad numbers <laughs> for women in partnership. And those are the firms that are dragging that percentage down, you know, to that 26%. So we can see the choices that are being made on both levels. We can see, uh, we, we are seeing pretty much an even number on the associate level of women versus men. So that has been something that has been a real bright spot you know, for the law firms. They are hiring uh, almost just as many women as they are men. The disparity is in the partnership because women are not being promoted to partner and in some instances, and women and men are leaving at about the same rate, right? They're just not getting promoted to partner. And I have to say, um, I, I was gonna bring this up later, but it just kind of folds in with, with what we're seeing. We'll, we'll hear many reasons why this occurs, and hopefully we'll hear what firms can do to embat it, combat it. But there is a problem surrounding these numbers. This morning in the Times, there, there was an article that really struck a chord with me. And it was about young women deciding not to go in leadership. They weren't going to go into leadership because it all looked like it cost too much, too much of a personal sacrifice, 
too much uh, risk. They don't want to run. They don't want to risk running for office because you 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 face misogyny. You face all kinds of barriers that are difficult to handle. And their and their response was, "Who needs it? Who needs it?" You have millennials right right now that are reluctant to get on that partnership track because it just you know it, it's difficult. It's long. The requirements are insane, and they're like, "Who needs it?" Well, you have women saying the same thing because it just seems unattainable. If you are at a firm that has 13% of your partnership women, how likely is it going to be that you're going to stay at that firm? Is it going to look like it's insurmountable odds to get in leadership? And once you get there, what do you get? You get to work 80 hours a week. What's your prize? You know, money isn't the same driver as it once was. Right. So I think the risk that we have is that fewer women are going to be interested in making partner unless they begin to make changes and put more women in leadership and understand, you know, what women face in the industry. And we're getting, Laura, people asking for the uh, New York Times piece in the, in the comments. So we will share that with you. Yeah. So this, this is very sobering. And now, I mean, I want to ask you guys, like, so are you surprised with the data that Laura has presented? Alexis is like, mm, this is no. Thursday. This is just Thursday, guys. Sorry. I'm a diversity <laughs> professional. Like, Let's talk. I want to hear from <laughs> your perspectives. What do you think about the data? So Alexis, I was- I'll, I live in this data, so I'm very familiar with the data, yeah. <laughs> and I think it reflects what we know is we, in general, talking about large law firms, they were not created with women in mind. They are based on systems that were not made for people who look different from or have lives different from. You know, I mean, many of us work at firms that are literally over 100 years old. Right. And that's not to say we haven't changed structures and grown and become, become more savvy, but I, I fundamentally think there's actually a mismatch in terms of the structure of law firms. This is like hard to say. This is like blasphemous stuff. Um, in terms of the structure of law firms and our views on talent management and people management, generally as lawyers, it was you apprentice, someone will take you under their wing. And I think as a lot of law firms have scaled, they have relied on that exact same model, even though we've brought in, you know, chief talent offers, officers and directors of professional development and offer a lot of things, ultimately we, they are still predicated upon, you know, success is predicated upon personal relationships. And, you know, I hope as we, you know, look forward and for me, if you ever feel like follow me on LinkedIn, I talk a lot about systems. Mm-hmm. We have to develop talent management systems to more intentionally train and help our people matriculate in a way that's reflective of, you know, the millennia that we live in and is not, you know, still carrying these like sort of vestiges of that, like the noble profession of law where, you know, some older partner took you under his wing and gave you a book of business. But I I truly think that's a lot of what we still have happening on the ground, even at the largest, most sophisticated firms. Yeah. And those headlines, Alexis, that I pulled, like those were from 2006, 2009, 2012. I mean, they're all still ringing true today. Um, Danielle, as someone who's now a CTO and who's done this for many years and is working, I'm sure, to create programs to attract, you know, different kinds, you know, to keep and to attract, retain talent. What is this, you know, what, what is this, what does the data mean to you? What, what does it say to you? And also I'm curious from everyone, millennials, generation Z, they want different things then, you know, Xers want, um, how does that factor into this? Yeah, I mean, the data, like you said, is sobering and I would take it one step further. I think if we broke it down, I know at least in my firm, um, by equity and non-equity shareholders, those or partners, those two levels, we're going to see even, you know, larger gaps and, and bigger distinctions. And, you know, Laura touched on this, but I really think at a high level, um, women, don't, when I talk to them, they don't see it. They don't want it. They're less excited. They wonder if it's worth it. They feel like they can't do it all. And in some instances, they feel like they don't know how. So they're opting out. And that's what we really, you know, want to combat is, you know, making this something that is very accessible, that is appealing, 
um, that you know we can inspire women to be change agents. And to do that, we got to get more women in the partnership ranks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something I'll just add, just to add some dimension to this, there certainly is a component of opting out, but particularly for women of color, it's often <laughs> not a matter of opting out. And right. so the reasons women of color leave law firms will often vary. And so I know there's some statistics out there um, that Erin Reeve, she's the CEO of an organization called Next Nextions, about so particularly like black women tend to be the primary breadwinner in their <laughs> households, second to white men. And so oftentimes that narrative of like all the women are leaving to have babies is not the case for the majority and particularly not the case for women of color. And so I think, um, Danny, what you said is absolutely right. But I did just want to add that that nuance that we can't globalize that, that right. narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to touch on something Alexis you know, mentioned about how um, the organic development of relationships happens in law firms, you know, I, I don't think we're ever going to get a, to a point where those relationships are eradicated because, I mean, that is the practice of law. That's how, you know, that's how you bring junior lawyers up to being senior lawyers and how they develop the skill set to build their own practice. But I think the focus really needs to be on how those relationships develop. And before, law firms kind of sat back and allowed them to happen organically. And I think now you're really going to have to see a lot more intervention um, by the firms to really, you know, take a role in helping build relationships um, between the current existing shareholders and their high performers, you know, women and diverse attorneys. And I, I will add, especially in light of COVID, I think oh, yeah. relationships and women have had a harder time maintaining them and, and building them in this new environment. Yeah, I was going to ask you guys, like, what have you done? Like, I mean, I, you know, I used to plan like mentoring events, like let's go bowling. Uh, let's do this. Let's match up for a cooking event. And let's put the, uh, you know, the old white guy, pot guy, guy partner with the women. And let's, you know, try to foster these relationships. What are you guys doing now with COVID? Um, are you doing like Zoom trivia nights? Like it's not that easy, right? Or is it is it better because you can do one-on-one -on -one Zooms? So, I mean, I, I know that overall we have to get far more intentional about work allocation and staffing. Yeah. And so something I talk a lot about is systems and you know, mentorship programs are great and sponsorship programs are fine, um, but I work really close, closely with my chief legal talent officer to focus on the ways that we can elevate those talent management systems to have more equitable distributions of work. And obviously if we're talking, you know, senior associates or at you know, my firm senior counsel, that's gonna look different, but doing what we can to systematize. Um, just the other day, I, I shared a quote on LinkedIn by James Clear that's, and where he says, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And so generally what we all are doing as large law firms is we have some like really great goals that we've written down about women and ethnic and racial minorities and LGBTQ and veterans and people with disabilities, but ultimately we don't have systems in place. And so I think you're right, Stephanie, we've lost those, those sort of more impromptu, organic, maybe affinity group driven opportunities. Um, but my hope is that we're working to close the gap by more heavily relying on talent management systems, but it's been really hard. Like we can't, we haven't pivoted on a dime. I think all of our organizations have had a lot of conversations with um, the women at our firms, with the women's networks mm -hmm. and mobilized to do what we can to support them. But it, it's hard. Like it's, it's frankly, it's been very hard. But that being said, this year has been a good year for women in terms of the fact that they, I mean, good and bad, right? You can work from home, but you also have to, you know, you've got your kids running across the Zoom. You're trying to homeschool you are trying to work. There is no balance between work and home because there is no separation between the two. Um, so it's been an unprecedented year 
Um, I think long-term is going to have a very good effect for women, but I think now during the pandemic, it's much harder on women. At the beginning, everybody thought it was cute when kids and pets and things were in the background of a Zoom, but now that we're going on longer and longer, there's less of an appetite for having a life behind you when you're on Zoom and you have to keep everybody quiet in the background. And unfortunately, women are often the ones responsible for the homeschooling and for uh, the bulk of of child care or caring for elderly relatives or whatever kind of um, family is, is in the background. I do think though that going forward, this might be a net gain for women. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jennifer, did you see like what I had to do? I, w- I had to pull, I had to put this on my lap while this was happening. <laughs> this background. Not cute anymore. It's annoying. Sometimes I leave my apartment to get away from my obligations. <laughs> Jennifer, what are you seeing in terms of the candidates who come to you? And like, you know, Laura and Leopard had some really interesting data that they shared with me earlier this year when they were looking at 2020, which was not actually a bad year for law firms. Most people stayed put. Now there's movement. What are people looking for in terms of when they're thinking about leaving their firms in terms of women? What are they looking for and why are they leaving? when they come to you? Well, there are a lot of different reasons, so I'm not sure I can pick just one, but I do think that now that we've gone through, everybody worked remotely for at least part of these last 13 months, whether you worked at a firm that is back in person now or a firm that isn't even talking about it. So a lot of women are seeing that there could be that flexibility and it is possible not to agree to a commute five days a week. So maybe they can be at that bigger firm in the city, even if they work in the suburbs and they have a family because maybe when we go back to work, they can do that two or three or four days a week instead of all the time. And some women are looking for a lot more flexibility and they see the potential for perhaps working remotely almost full-time. There are a lot of, of different ways we can make this work for women. Now that we have the tech in place and everybody knows how to work with remote teams, it doesn't have to go back to the way it was. Danielle, Jill, and Relaxis, are you seeing your firms be more amenable to that sort of thing? Or are you hearing them say what some of my clients are saying, we're going to go back to normal as soon as possible. I want everyone in the office vaccinated. You know, I'm seeing both. And I, I, it worries me because I don't think we're ever going to be, you know, back to normal. Um, But I am seeing some firms say, you know, when everyone back in the office, I want to go back to the way things were. What are you seeing and or do you think firms will be more flexible? Yeah, I think they're going to have to be. I think we're going to risk um, not recruiting the best talent and not retaining the best talent if we don't learn from the lesson, you know, if we don't take these lessons from COVID and apply them to the future. Um, we will absolutely need more flexibility. And it's not just things like flexibility you know, working from home a few days, it's different, different start times and end times and, you know, different resources that you need. Mm-hmm. So our eyes have been opened to that. And yes, you have to balance that with the fear. We hear from management, you know, all the time that we don't want this erosion of our culture and that a lot of the reasons why we have been successful is because we've been working remotely, but we had that foundation. We built the relationships before, and now we're just you know, kind of feeding off of those. But as we hire more people and more time goes by, um, you know, we don't want to be a, a completely remote firm. I think most firms you know, feel like that. We're not interested in virtual. We want that collaboration, you know, back and, you know, we want some of the organic benefits that we talked about before, um, but it's never going to look the same. I, I just, I don't see it being the same. The the flexibility and, you know, these differing schedules are, are here to stay. Have you had to talk your firm into that or do you feel like leadership is open to it? I think they're cautious. Um, I, they want to be open to it, but sometimes you know, they just don't know what they're, they're concerned. So I, I wouldn't say that I've had to talk leadership into it, but I need to let them know what that looks like yeah. um, because they like it, the idea of it, but still not comfortable, you know, seeing how it's going to play out. Well, it's like Alexa said, it's a hundred year old institution and it's always right. been done the way that it's been done. I mean, how many times have you guys heard that, you know, that saying, right? <laughs> um, so it's, this is a, this is a watershed year. 
Jill and Alexis, what do you guys think? Do you think these changes will be permanent at your firms? I do. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> Alexis has this smile on her face. I like, and I just feel like she's just like cautiously optimistic, but knowing following, and you guys should follow Alexis on LinkedIn because I always learn things from her. But yeah, Jill, what were you going to say? Um, I was going to say, I think the firm's being really mindful about it. They know that there is a shift and that they're going, you know, to have to um, find a way to make it work and actually have created a task force from, um, employees all across the firm to weigh in on what a flexible and remote work policy might look like and, and you mm -hmm. know, going to release something um, well ahead of when our target return to the office is so that people have time to prepare. So I'm, that's very encouraging. Um, and I agree with Jennifer that this could be a net gain for women, um, but I think really for that to happen, there has to be kind of this cultural shift where um, working remotely applies kind of across the board and men are just as encouraged to work remotely as women. Um, so it doesn't become something where it's another way to, you know, be different. Um, and then I think we're, we could be in good shape. Alexis, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what, what Danny said. It's interesting, though, because with the attorneys, a lot of attorneys have been working remotely for a long time. I mean, depending on your firm, maybe some firms demand more FaceTime, and this was certainly a shock to them. For a lot of firms, this was so hard because we moved all of our business services professionals remote, and that was a major challenge. But I do think most firms fall into like, yeah, we're going to have to be more flexible, but we do want to see you sometimes. And certainly people are concerned, particularly senior leadership who remember they got their biggest case because they ran into someone in the hallway. And if we're not going to run into each other in the hallway, how will anybody get their cases? I mean, or matters or whatever you're working on. And so there's, there's a lot of that too, but we're just going to have to, to innovate and to figure it out. Those organic mentorship moments are missing and the relationship building is hard and you know that there's something to be said for that I mean there there are also those firms that didn't you know didn't know how to even move to a, a virtual environment or if the firms are were uncomfortable with with doing so that were a little bit at a disadvantage Jennifer Alexis and Jill this question is for you guys what made you all decide to get off the um the hamster wheel yourselves and stop practicing law and why didn't you each want to make partner. I didn't see my 15 year old daughter for about two years when she was awake. So um, she was from when she was a baby until she was about two. And I was actually looking for an in-house role when I came upon recruiting. I was looking to give up my commute and to have more predictable hours because I had a litigation focused specialty. And sometimes it was just it wasn't the firm's fault. I actually, I worked at Littler and they have great stats for women. It wasn't that they don't make female partners. It was that the, the lifestyle just wasn't conducive if I wanted to see the child I had and planned on having a second child. So for my family, it was a better decision. And I, I, I came upon recruiting accidentally and actually was very lucky because I loved it. That's great. Jill, how about you? So um, multifaceted, but I think I had decided actually that I didn't want to be a partner um, even before having my first daughter. Um, I, I, I saw kind of that road, right? And a lot of it requires um, a lot of isolation um, and time in front of your computer and you're not actually um, you know out there talking with people and, and dealing with people on a daily basis and that is um, something that I crave as an extrovert so being a an associate in a large law firm you know was difficult for me from from that standpoint um, you know the work itself wasn't difficult. It was very interesting and, and, and I enjoyed, you know, the intellectual part of it, but I really felt that I was lacking with the um, interactive aspects. Um, so, but, but then having a daughter really kind of pushed it um, 
into pushed me into looking for something different and uh, recruiting was was what I found. Okay, great. Alexis, how about you? Yeah, I think my reasons are similar to Jill's. For me, it wasn't so much the lifestyle or the difficulty of firm life, which I think some people might find surprising, but I just had passions and curiosities with other things. And it, it turns out if you can align those with your job, you'll you'll be good at your job. And so, so the, all the things that I focus on now doing diversity and inclusion work, um, I, I mean, I've, I constantly consume information that makes me better as a professional. And I couldn't say that when I was a labor and employment lawyer. And I, the, and there's overlap there, right? It makes sense that I eventually went to L&E because I was like, well, that's where the people are. And then I was like, oh, but I don't need this law part anymore. Um, and so I, I have a, I think I, I have a great respect for practicing lawyers. I think there are a lot of people who are very passionate about being lawyers and thus are very good at it. But I think my lack of interest and curiosity in the subject matter was a was a like a ceiling for me that I wouldn't really surpass because I wasn't going to put in the extra effort the way the way you need to to be truly great. When someone comes to you, one of the associates at your firms, what do you guys tell them in terms of what are the characteristics or what are the things that they would need to do to make partner? Danielle, can we start with you? Sure. What I tell um, you know, young women in particular is to be vocal. I think that they need to let people know about their goals. I sit on the panel um, of evaluators when we do associate evaluations and they're, they're just not as, um, I don't wanna say they're not ambitious because I think they are, they're just, they don't discuss it as much. So I think you, you know, need to put it out there. I, I tell young women, um, find mentors, tell people that you want to go. And, you know, we talk about mentoring and sponsorship and women, the organic relationships that evolve, women will gravitate to other women, but they need to find those old white men, you know, partners and sponsors and, you know, find out what their path was, you know, did they inherit business? Did they become critical to a client? Did they start with small businesses and then watch those businesses grow for business development? And also under kind of the umbrella of being vocal, you know, business development is a big part of making partner. And I just try to encourage women to ask for the credit and seek the credit that they need. So, you know, don't, this, it's not the time to be shy. You need to advocate for yourself. Um, we ask our attorneys when they're ready for promotion to do like an advocacy memo for themselves. And it is really interesting to see the different wording that men use versus women. You know, there's just a, a lack of, of confidence. Women really sell themselves short. So that's my biggest ed, you know, piece of advice is, you know, speak up. Okay. Jill, Alexis, Jennifer, any thoughts? There's, there's a lot of paths to partnership. It's fine. I was just on one of these talks at my firm. And so it really depends on what sort of lawyer you want to be. I mean, fortunately, I do work for, for a firm where if that is something you're interested in doing, the firm will support you in getting there. Like Foley is like a one-to-one -one associates to partner ratio. So it is not a, you know, we're, we're weeding you out. Most of you aren't going to make it sort of thing. But it really depends. And fortunately, I also work for a firm that recognizes your 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 practice is going to look different than someone else's. So certainly, you know, see what others are doing, but you have to figure out your niche. Although it was funny because I think Danny is super correct about the need to speak up. But I also do just looking at back to institutions and culture, like my job is to make the organization recognize that they value a certain type of communication, right? To, and to recognize that culturally valuing that can be a disconnect with promotion of certain sorts of individuals. And so if you come from a culture, for example, that is much more collectivist, um, and we see that particularly with like newer immigrant populations where it's like, keep your head down, work hard, they will notice, right? And you don't have like kind of like white collar parents mentoring you on how to boast. Right. That can be a huge dis. And so, so those sort, sorts of things are like the gaps we need to close and sure, we can educate people to learn how to communicate in our environment, but there also has to be this movement in the environment to understand that there's not one way for somebody to, you know, prove themselves as, as being valuable. Sorry, I'm all over the place, but it just made me think, think of that. Because ultimately, we all, our organizations value usually very male, very masculine styles of, of communicating and leadership. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we can move to a way that's you know, open to more styles of communication. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I agree with both of those comments. And I would just add um, that, you know, women should try to seek out you know, sponsors who are in leadership roles and, you know, ask to work with them, you know, try to, to build a relationship. Um, and, you know, it, when that relationship starts to develop, you know, ask for, for them to take the responsibility and helping you achieve your career goals. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you're, more vocal, like Danny was saying, I think um, it, that will help, you know, shift the balance of, you know, who is being sponsored. One of the things that obviously happens is we don't always stay at the same firm, right? You don't, you're not necessarily always homegrown. A lot of lawyers move to different firms and there's opportunity in doing so. And I think, you know, the idea of being at the same firm your whole career is like kind of dwindled. So Jennifer, let's start with you. Any thoughts, you know, if you're thinking about leaving your firm and going to another firm, what are some of the things for a woman that you should be looking for in another firm? And then I'd like to ask the other panelists in terms of being successful as a lateral for a woman, would you say that there are different things to, to think about? And, and, you know, ultimately path to partner, or maybe not path to counsel, whatever it may be, path to success, carving your own path to success at a firm, what can you do as a lateral to ensure that you are successful? Because the research on Leopard sometimes shows that laterals are not always successful. So how do we become successful as a lateral? So unfortunately, the worst kept secret is that you have the most power to law firm when you have your own clients. And sometimes women don't have an opportunity or maybe right. not the time or the encouragement to do the level of business development that some of the men do. So that's the first thing that I talk to all of my candidates about. It's really important to have leverage over your own career and be able to have all of the choices available to you to have your own clients who you go after yourself, who will follow you and to speak up for the credit for that because it, it does give you a lot more um, control over your own career. I think when anyone is looking to make a move, but you know, women in particular, they have to think about what, what will help them be successful? What kind of platform are they looking for? Do they need any flexibility in their schedule? Do they need to work in a team? Do they need mm -hmm. certain things? Because once you go through that integration process at the next firm, you want to be a superstar there. You want to move only when um, the platform will help you truly flourish and maximize your opportunities, whether it's an opportunity to do more of the work that you wanted to do, to grow the client base that you've started growing, maybe to inherit some clients in a succession planning opportunity, which is also a nice thing, especially for women who are a little bit behind in their business development because they've had family responsibilities or the firm didn't really encourage it before. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Would anyone, we don't, you know, feel free to answer if you'd um, like. Mm. I'll touch, so lateraling is hard. It depends on your level too. I, I think depend, particularly if you lateral a bit more junior and you're still an associate, a lot of firms don't have a really robust way to engage you in the firm. And if they have lots of offices, you might be in like, hi, I'm here. How do I get work? Right. So you do need to be prepared to, you know, be, be, be gregarious, particularly in this environment and really get to know that firm. And of course, what uh, Jennifer said about, you know, at some point, you know, the epitome of, you know, the height of legal practice is having your own clients. But the mm -hmm. other thing is on the flip side, because I want to bring some value for like all the talent management professionals who are watching, the stats just showed that men are more likely to lateral to another firm. So a lot of us are diluting our partner pipelines with lateral hires, right? So we might start them at the same pace, men and women leave at the same rate, but as we replace, the, replace that headcount, there's a strong chance we are replacing them with men. So by the time it comes to the like, look, let's look at our partner class, the laterals are more likely to be men. And now when we promote, we are more likely to promote men to partner. And so there's a really strong need if you can to pay attention to that, to try to balance that pipeline, to go out of your way, to make sure that you are recruiting um, women and you know other you know ethnic minorities and other types of attorneys as well. And the other thing I just wanna highlight in case we don't get to it is for the practicing lawyers out there, or actually really for anyone, I'd recommend this book. 
um, which is by Joan Williams, What Works for Women at Work. And it is, it is affirming. She goes through the four types of bias that women typically um, experience in the workplace. It can really give you a, a playbook or a roadmap, or at least make you feel like you're not crazy if you are encountering certain things. And she also has a chapter dedicated to the experiences of women of color. Um, and look specifically at Black, Asian, and Hispanic women and talks about how the biases encountered can be different. So that's, that's something else. I've not about. heard of that book, Alexis. So we, we'll great. put that in the, um, we'll put that in the takeaways. We're getting uh, some questions about salary discrepancies, which I, I wanted to cover. Um, so why, what, can we cover that? Um, you know, and it's, it's hard. I, I, I don't know but I'm guessing it's got to be with bonuses because for most firms, compensation, well, for a lot of firms, the big firms, compensation is set for the most part, right? So for a lot of the associate level, but not at the higher levels, not partner level. Right. So let's, can we talk about how women can deal with the salary and discrepancies among women lawyers and male lawyers? Yeah. I don't know if that's for the women to deal with or if that's for the firm to deal with. Right. So, you know, we have a wonderful chief diversity and inclusion officer um, at my firm, and we do a compensation audit. So I do think firms have to hold themselves accountable for that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to add on to what Alexa said about, you know, the bias that exists sometimes in the recruiting and the promotion process. I've done and been a part and an attendee at a ton of you know, implicit bias seminars, but there's always something that you learn and we need continual training and we need to encourage each other to interrupt the bias during those processes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having the right people on the hiring committee, having the right people on the promotion committee. And when you see, you know, that there is a woman being, a woman being considered, you know, to come in as partner and there's a man being considered and you, you feel like, you know, there's, there's much more uncertainty about whether or not she'll be able to bring the business over than there is when you're having the same conversation. You know, I challenge myself to speak up during those things and really need to train the leaders to do that. So I do think those things, including compensation, really fall to the firm. Yes, you know, a woman can raise her hand and say, I don't think I'm being paid enough, but she shouldn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's right. You have to know what the numbers are. Um, at your own firm to, to be able to address it. Um, and also it'll be interesting um, now that so many uh, states have adopted the um, practice of not allowing for employers to ask what your past salary history is and see whether that starts shifting the balance so that you know a, a consistent pay that is lesser than, you know, maybe what it should have been um, doesn't follow you. And so you really are evaluated on, you know, what your um, business is and not what you were just paid at your prior firm. There's so much research that says that women are more uncomfortable asking for sal certain salaries. I, I know I am, and it's something I have personally worked for uh, to get better at. I would I put in a plug for using a good reputable recruiter in that circumstance because yeah. you don't have to do your own salary negotiation. I think even men are a little bit uncomfortable, but women tend to be much less comfortable asking for what they're worth in the context of a salary negotiation. And I think it's a lot easier to use a third party to do that. Yeah, have an advocate who can do it for and who you. Knows the market and knows what mm -hmm. other people are being paid. But you're right, Jill, in terms of the fact that like having that, um, you know, asking for prior salary history off the bat is uh, taken off the table is is great. Um, somebody brought up in the comments that if there, sometimes there is a question on applications about salaries and law firms should really take that off. Yeah, I think if you haven't updated your um, applications, you really should talk to your labor and employment lawyers about that too. I'd like to ask you each to tell us a, you know, a tip about how you've been successful in this industry yourselves and maybe built your brands or, um, you know, built your careers and, and what advice you would give to, you know, other folks out there, whether it's the talent management folks or the lawyers out there, whoever you want to give it to. So Laura, can we start with you first? <laughs> sure. Well, I kind of snuck in this industry and, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I got in because I just made my own way, you know, um, 
But I have to say, even owning my own business, um, there have been times where I experienced misogyny within my own company, where I actually had to tell someone, uh, if there were a man sitting in my seat, you would not have said that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, caught them up short. So it exists, it's out there, and every single one of us has dealt with it at one time or another. And I'm, I'm just here because I kind of forced my way in the door. So, so here, here I am. Jill? So I would say it's having people who are going to put their social capital on the line for you. And, you know, I have certainly risen to where I am because I have had, you know, those, um, those people uh, speak up for me. Um, and I think, you know, that that is just um, something that, you know, you can't really substitute. Um, and it's having, you know, those affirmations said about you to people in key leadership roles um, that is really going to help, you know, boost your career. Jennifer? I do agree with Jill. The relationships that you create along the way are really very important and it's nice to have advocates. But much like Laura, I just created my own company and got to be the boss. So I got mm -hmm. to be doing exactly what I like to do every day. And it it's a lot more fun that way. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Alexis? Sure. I guess two years back, I decided that I was not negotiable and that I wasn't willing to you know, negotiate myself and offer up my, my free time or my time for self-care um, to other people, which has been transformative. And as pessimistic as it may sound, I deeply believe that you are in control of your own destiny. The cavalry is not coming. <laughs> and so if you're waiting for someone else to bring you your dream job or your, you know, you, they're, they're not coming. And so hopefully there's things you can do to really take control of your, your career. And then more, more tactically, as it relates to the promotion of women in large law firms, I really think every firm needs to really focus on their data. You know, you should know it. There's far more sophisticated things we can do with it. And I'm looking forward to firms focusing more on systematizing fairness and equity and not relying on it being this, this organic thing that just one day happens. Mm -hmm. That's great. And Danielle? Uh, we talked about developing relationships. That was definitely key to my success. I developed relationships with people that were great examples and great mentors. I also developed great relationships with peers. I think women at some point in their career face imposter syndrome. And if you don't have, you know, that peer group that can really pump you up and, you know, tell you that you deserve to be there, um, that that can be detrimental to you. So you need to have, you know, build those relationships at all levels. And finally, I would say that I asked, I, I asked for opportunities. Um, yeah. When I would draft an email, I wanted it to come out for me and not just be the ghostwriter. When I put a presentation together, I asked if I could be the one to present it to the board of directors. And I took on and raised my hand and volunteered for challenges. Even as I was doing so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I don't know if I know how to do this, but I'm going to learn and I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to do it well. So take on those challenges, ask for those opportunities, even if they're outside of your comfort zone. I love that. I would add build your brand every day internally and externally, especially right now, even when you're not looking for a job. So LinkedIn is probably the most important place for you all to do that. So those of you on partnership track and those of you not on partnership track, think about doing it now. And every single talent professional here, um, LinkedIn is going to be the place to be building your brand um, long after the pandemic. So continue to network and continue to push out content of value to you and um, network. So want to thank everyone for being here. We are going to have a recording of this for the for um, those of you who want to send this. We have a couple of requests for people to send this to their internal teams. I want to thank each of the panelists for also being here. And um, there'll be more webinars like this. Um, so stay tuned. Laura, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, you know, uh, all the men believe they should be partner, president, you name it right off the bat, right? It's women that second guess ourselves all the time. So if there's one takeaway from today, it's the cavalry is not coming. Oh, I know, I love that. I, I, I love right? that. Yeah. This is not the Cinderella story. The cavalry isn't coming, save yourself.
I you know. And listen, there are never enough hours in the day. Um, the same amount of hours in the day for men, but somehow we figure it out. So just, I like Danielle, what you said, like, um, figure it out, like just do it. Even if maybe when you're not ready for it. Um, so I do, I love that. Alexis, what was the name of the book again? Can you hold it up? I want to try. Yeah, it's called what works for women at work. It's probably, what back, it might be backwards. At work. Okay. <laughs> yeah, by Joan uh, Williams. Joan Williams is everything. She's Great. Okay. When we will do a recap email and I'll make sure that we put the name of the book in there. So thank you guys. Um, thank you all for being here and take care. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.